Today is day six for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 2nd through the 8th, Ephesians, for the perfecting of the saints. Saturday, October 7th, 2023, Ephesians 5, 21 through 32 in chapter 6. Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9 contains one of several New Testament household codes, which are sets of instructions to wives, husbands, children, parents, servants, and masters. The codes recorded in Ephesians and Colossians are both given in connection with instructions on congregational worship. Since the early congregations of the church met to worship and partake of the sacrament in church members' homes, the congregations Paul addressed would have included all members of a typical Greco-Roman household. Fathers and husbands, mothers and wives, children, slaves and masters. In the household setting, the well-being of house church congregations was inseparable from the well-being of Christian families. In the household code found in Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9, interpersonal relationships are defined in terms of each person's relationship with Christ. Paul said that wives should submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands should love their wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Children should obey their parents in the Lord. Parents are instructed to raise their children in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Slaves should serve their masters as unto Christ and as to the Lord. Masters are to deal with their servants while remembering their master also is in heaven. Paul's words remind us that our relationship with Christ should guide and define our relationships with all others. As you read Ephesians 5, 21 through 32 and 6, 1 through 4, think about how the counsel in these verses could strengthen your family relationships. It is important to note that Paul's words in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 were written in the context of the social customs of his era. Prophets and apostles today teach that men are not superior to women and that spouses are meant to be equal partners. For example, how does Christ show his love for the saints? What does this imply about how spouses as equal partners should treat each other? What message do you find for yourself in these verses? Husbands and wives love each other. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said marriage and love are eternal. Those who continue in the married state in eternity have exaltation and possess the attributes of godliness. They then love each other with a perfect and abiding love, and the marriage status, here in mortality, is the schooling, preparatory state in which love may grow and blossom into that fullness of joy and perfection one can come only when the body and spirit are inseparably connected in immortality. Hence Paul, using Christ as his pattern, here teaches, Christ has taken the church as his bride. He is married to that body of true believers who have become saints. They are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. He loves them, gave himself for them, and cleansed and sanctified them. He will perfect and glorify them, so they can dwell with him eternally in holiness and exaltation. He is their Savior. And so it is in the true order of matrimony. A man marries a wife for time and for all eternity. Those so married are separate from all others. She is now his, he is hers, and they become one flesh. They are no longer twain, but have one body. Those who receive all the ordinances of the house of the Lord must get them in the same way that Jesus Christ obtained them. Thus following the pattern of Christ, their head, they must then love their wives, sacrifice their well-being and salvation, and guide them in holiness. Until they are cleansed, sanctified, and perfected, until they are prepared for exaltation in that glorious heaven where the family unit continues. Husbands thus become, in effect, the saviors of their wives and their families, and these, in turn, are called to bestow reverence and respect upon the heads of their eternal family units. Truly, in Paul's language, this is a great mystery, as least until men's minds are opened by the power of the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 21-23 Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the husband as the head, said, Marriage is a partnership, and there is a senior partner. 
God set man to lead, to preside, to be the last word. Woman is obligated to conform, to obey, to be in subjection to the will of the husband, as long as his rulership is exercised in righteousness. Ephesians 5, 24-25 Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Paul taught that all members of the church should submit themselves to one another, or in other words, place others ahead of themselves. He then explained how the principle of submitting oneself applied in family and household relationships, starting with wives and husbands. For wives, this means submitting themselves to their husbands as they would to the Lord. For husbands, this means loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If couples are truly united, then any sacrifice made on behalf of one's spouse inevitably brings blessings to oneself. Thus, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, Happiness in marriage is not so much a matter of romance as it is an anxious concern for the comfort and well-being of one's companion. Any man who will make his wife's comfort his first concern will stay in love with her throughout their lives and through the eternity yet to come. Paul's counsel that wives should submit to their husbands does not justify male dominion. People in Greco-Roman society regarded the father as being the head of the extended family and the absolute authority over the entire household. Therefore, Paul's teachings represented a dramatic change in these traditional ideas because he defined husbands and fathers' roles in terms of Christ's love and sacrifice for the church. Paul declared that the manner in which Jesus Christ loved and sacrificed for the church was the ultimate example of how a husband should love and sacrifice for his wife. In our day, church leaders have taught that men are not to dominate family relationships, but by divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught priesthood leaders, The wife you choose will be your equal. Paul declared, Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In the marriage companionship, there is neither inferiority nor superiority. The woman does not walk ahead of the man, neither does the man walk ahead of the woman. They walk side by side as a son and daughter of God on an eternal journey. She is not your servant, your chattel, nor anything of the kind. I am confident that when we stand before the bar of God, there will be little mention of how much wealth we accumulated in life, or of any honors which we may have achieved, but there will be searching questions concerning our domestic relationships, and I am convinced that only those who have walked through life with love, respect, and appreciation for their companions and children will receive from their eternal judge the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. President Spencer W. Kimball said, One of the most provocative and profound statements in Holy Writ is Paul's instructions to husbands and wives concerning their duty to each other and to their families. First he commands the woman, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands and unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord, subject yourselves unto your own husbands. He says, as unto the Lord. Can you conceive that? Does that mean something to you as you listen to the Lord's counsel, do his will, follow his righteous precepts, serve him faithfully? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Can you find in all the holy scriptures where the Lord Jesus Christ ever failed his church? Can you find any scriptures that says he was untrue to his people? to his neighbors, friends, and associates. Was he faithful? Was he true? Is there anything good and worthy that he did not give? Then that is what we ask, what he asks of a husband, every husband. Can you think of a single exception in his great life? There should be none in yours. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be with their own husbands in everything. Many misconceptions, many errors are creeping into the thoughts of great numbers of people in our day. Much is said in Paul's words as unto the Lord. Let it sink deep into your hearts. A woman need have no fear of being imposed upon or being subject to any doctrinal measures or improper demands. When her husband is thoughtful, 
self-sacrificing, and worthy. One would think that no intelligent woman would hesitate to submit herself to her own true righteous husband in everything, but sometimes we are shocked to see the wife take over the leadership, naming the one to pray, the place to be, the things to do. Husbands are commanded, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ loved the church and its people so much that he voluntarily endured persecution for them, suffered humiliating indignities for them, stoically withstood pain and physical abuse for them, and finally gave his precious life for them. When the husband is ready to treat his household in that manner, not only the wife, but all the family will respond to his leadership. There is a scripture which says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Your wife is your friend. You should be willing to go even to the extent of giving your life for her, if the need should appear. Would you give your life for her? You need to ask yourself, Can I love my wife even as Christ also has loved the church? Can you think of how he loved the church? Its every breath was important to him. Its every growth, its every individual, was precious to him. He gave to those people all his energy, all his power, all his interest. He gave his life, and what more could one give? Ephesians 5.26 That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the washing of water by the word, said baptism is called the washing of regeneration, and it is the way non-members of the church gain the Holy Spirit, by whose power they are cleansed and sanctified. But Paul is here speaking of how the Lord sanctifies the church, those who have already received the washing of regeneration. It would appear thus that he, though may have had reference to those washings which the Lord says are performed only in the house which you have built in my name, and with reference to which he commanded, Sanctify yourselves, yea, purify your hearts, and cleanse your hands and your feet before me, that I may make you clean, that I may testify unto your Father and your God and my God, that you are clean from the blood of this wicked generation. Ephesians 5.27 That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, As the Lord perfects and glorifies his church, so husbands are expected to lead their wives to perfection, glory, and exaltation. Ephesians 5.28-33 So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Parents to teach, children to obey. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, When the father of spirits entrusts his spirit children to the care and custody of mortal parents, he does so upon the most explicit and positive conditions. For instance, parents are commanded to bring up their children in light and truth. They are to teach them the plan of salvation and the whole law of the whole gospel. Theirs is the specific obligation to teach their children to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord, as also to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost by laying on of hands when eight years old. Indeed, parents are to care for their children in all things, both temporal and spiritual. As King Benjamin counseled, Ye will not suffer your children that ye go hungry or naked. Neither will ye suffer that they transgress the law of God, and fight and quarrel one with another, and serve the devil, who is the master of sin, and who is the evil spirit, which hath been spoken of by our fathers, he being an enemy to all righteousness. But ye will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. Ye will teach them to love one another, and to serve one another. And children come into mortality with the inborn requirement planted in their souls, by the very being who gave them birth as spirits to honor their parents and to obey their counsel and righteousness.
Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to in the Lord, said in righteousness. Ephesians 6, 2-3. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to live long on the earth, said God's promise to Israel was that if they honored their parents, their days would be long upon the land which he gave them. That is, by obedience, the land of promise was to be theirs from generation to generation. And in fact, they were scattered for rebellion and for apostasy, from those truths handed down from their fathers. But Paul here interprets the promise as a personal one. Obedient and faithful children are to have long lives upon the earth. That is, in the generality of instances, temporal life is prolonged by obedience to gospel laws. But more particularly, and in the ultimate sense, those who are God-fearing and righteous, meaning the meek, shall live upon the earth again in its final and celestial state. As part of his counsel on family relationships, Paul reiterated the commandment that children should honor their parents. And for the strength of youth, church leaders identified some ways children can do this. Honor your parents by showing love and respect for them. Obey them as they lead you in righteousness. Willingly help in your home. Participate in wholesome family activities and traditions. Join your family in family prayer, family scripture study, and family home evenings. Keeping these commandments strengthens and unifies families. Ephesians 6, 4 And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, And the priesthood led home, where the Father is eternal and the Spirit of the Lord dwells, parents represent the Lord in giving counsel and admonition to their children. Paul admonished parents to bring up their children in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Modern scripture provides specific instructions about the responsibilities parents have to raise their children up to the Lord, including helping children develop faith. Elder Kevin W. Pearson of the Seventy taught why parents should help children develop faith in Jesus Christ. As parents, we have been commanded to teach our children to understand the doctrine of faith in Christ, the Son of the living God. There is no other thing in which we can have absolute assurance. There is no other foundation in life that can bring the same peace, joy, and hope. In uncertain and difficult times, faith is truly a spiritual gift worthy of our utmost efforts. We can give our children education, lessons, athletics, the arts, and material possessions. But if we do not give them faith in Christ, we have given little. Make three lists, the responsibilities of a husband and father, the responsibilities of a wife and mother, and the responsibilities of children. How can the fulfillment of these responsibilities lead to unity in the home? Servants and masters judged by the same law. In New Testament times, slavery was a very common institution throughout the Roman Empire. Undoubtedly, many church members were either servants or had servants as part of their households. People became slaves by being captured in war, being sold to pay debts, or being kidnapped. Paul's counsel about how servants should act does not imply that he approved of the institution of slavery, but it teaches members of the church living in a culture with servants and masters, how those relationships should be guided by the gospel of Jesus Christ. President Spencer W. Kimball has shown that Paul's advice still has application today, even though slavery is much less common. Paul speaks of unholy masters and surely has reference to those who would defraud servants or employees and would not properly compensate for labors done or goods furnished. He likely has in mind men who are unkind demanding and inconsiderate of their subordinates. Paul, likewise, enjoyed a lofty standard upon employees. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Masters and slaves, kings and peasants, lords and vassals, all men, regardless of rank, caste, or social and economic status, are saved on the same terms and conditions. Every man shall be stripped of all rank and worldly honor. In that day when the Lord shall come in recompense, unto every man according to his work and measure, to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow man. These servants were slaves. The social structure which kept them in bondage 
was outside the power of the Ephesian saints to change or overthrow. Paul thus had no alternative but to recognize their state and counsel them how to live under it. Slavery, as such, is in fact abhorrent to gospel standards. It is not right, the Lord says, that any man should be in bondage one to another. Ephesians 6, 5-6 Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Elder Bruce McConkie referring to doing the will of God said keeping the commandments. Ephesians 6, 7, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to doing service, said laboring honestly and diligently, and referring to as to the Lord, said, service rendered to others should be performed as though for the Lord. President Kimball continued, we may take this to mean in modern terms that the servant and employee should consistently give honest service, full and complete, and do for his employer what he would want an employee to do for him if he himself were the employer. Ephesians 6, 8-9 Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, known owing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Put on the whole armor of God. As you read Ephesians 6, 10-18, consider why Paul named each piece of armor the way he did. Ephesians 6, 10-13 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Elder David A. Bednar said, The overreaching purpose of Heavenly Father's plan is for his children to become more like him. Accordingly, he provides us with essential opportunities to grow and progress. Our commitment to learn and live according to truth is increasingly important in a world that is in commotion and is ever more confused and wicked. We cannot expect simply to attend church meetings and participate in programs and thereby receive all of the spiritual edification and protection that will enable us to withstand in the evil day. What can I do to put on the whole armor of God? Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, the putting off of the natural man makes possible the putting on of the whole armor of God, which would not fully fit before. As he taught his readers how to defend themselves against spiritual wickedness, Paul drew upon the image of a soldier wearing armor. Paul listed the parts of a soldier's gear in the order a soldier would put them on and take them in hand. Symbolically, this showed how the gospel protects a person's overall spiritual soundness, including one's thoughts, intellect, feelings, and moral purity. President Harold B. Lee said, Now notice the nature of the armor that Paul puts on the man whom he is now preparing to withstand the powers of darkness. Ephesians 6.14 Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. President Lee continued, Now the loins is that part of the body between the lower rib and the hip, in which you will recognize are the vital organs, which have to do with reproduction. He was saying that that part of the body was one of the most vulnerable. We should have our loins girt about with armor. Now the kind of armor that was to protect us is even more interesting. We should have our loins girt about with truth. What is truth? Truth, the Lord said, was knowledge of things as they are, things as they were, and things as they are to come, which is going to guide us along the path of proper morals and or proper choices. It will be the knowledge of truth. There must be a standard by which we measure our conduct, else how shall we know which is right, and how shall we know which is wrong? 
Our loins shall be girt about with truth, the prophet said. Armor, belt, and girt tied around the waist. What the armor represents, truth. Protected body part, loins. What the protected body part may represent, our chastity, moral purity. President Lee continued, and then the next we would have a breastplate over the heart. Now in the scriptures you will remember that the heart has always been used to typify our conduct. And so we would have a breastplate over the heart. And the heart, what kind of breastplate, shall protect our conduct and life? We shall have over our hearts a breastplate of righteousness. Well, having learned truth, we have a measure by which we can judge between right and wrong, and so our conduct will always be gauged by that thing which we know to be true. Our breastplate to cover our conduct shall be the breastplate of righteousness. Armor breastplate, made of bronze or chain. What the armor represents. Righteousness, a brightness with God. Protected body part, heart. What the protected body part may represent. Our affections, emotions, loyalty. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. President Lee continued, and then he said, we should have the feet shod with the kind of armor that would protect our feet, suggesting the feet as the objectives, the goals of life, which we should have guarded by some kind of armor and protected from getting off on the wrong foot. With what shall we protect our feet, or by what shall we guard our objectives or our goals in life? All through the scriptures, there runs a phrase suggested by the kind of armor the Apostle Paul would put upon the feet. Listen to what he says. Your feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Interesting. What is the gospel of peace? The whole core and center of the gospel of peace was built around the person of him who was cradled in the manger. How fortunate are you if in your childhood, in the home of your father and mother, you were taught the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, the meaning of baptism, and what you gain by the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Fortunate is the child who has been taught to pray and who has been given those steps to take on through life, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Armor, boots, rugged shoes studded with nails for traction. What the armor represents. Preparation for the gospel of peace. Protected body part, feet. What the protected body part may represent our course of life, actions, places we go, and goals. Ephesians 6, 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Armor, shield, large oval made of two layers of wood, held together with iron and leather. What the armor represents. Faith. Protected body part. Entire body. What the protected body part may represent. Our whole soul. Paul taught that the shield of faith can deflect attacks of the adversary and quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught about the importance of the family in forging a shield of faith. The shield of faith is to be made and fitted in the family. No two can be exactly alike. Each must be handcrafted to individual specifications. The plan designed by the Father contemplates that man and woman, husband and wife, working together, fit each child individually made to buckle on so firmly that it can neither be pulled off nor penetrated by those fiery darts. It takes the steady strength of a father to hammer out the metal of it and the tender hands of a mother to polish and fit it on. Sometimes one parent is left to do it alone. It is difficult, but it can be done. In the church, we can teach about the materials from which a shield of faith is made. Reverence, courage, chastity, repentance, forgiveness, compassion. In church, we can learn how to assemble and fit them together. But the actual making of and fitting on of the shield of faith belongs in the family circle. Ephesians 6.17 And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the sword of God. President Lee continued. And then finally the helmet of salvation. Did you ever hear of that kind of helmet? The helmet of salvation? What is salvation? Salvation is to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from death and saved from sin. When those 
two things are missing from this earth, and when it has been sanctified and cleansed of its impurity, this shall be the place of salvation. On this earth will be the celestial kingdom, for there will be no more sin, no more death, for all the former things are done away. By whom? By the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, in effect, a helmet of salvation shall guide our thinking all through our lives. Armor, helmet, made of bronze with leather straps. What the armor represents. Salvation. Protected body part, head. What the protected body part may represent. Our thoughts and intellect. President Lee continued. Now there we have the four parts of the body that the apostle saw to be the most vulnerable to the powers of darkness, the loins typifying virtue, chastity, the heart typifying our conduct, our feet, our goals or objectives in life, and finally our head, our thoughts. Well now, the apostle Paul went one step further. He didn't leave the man just with the armor on and expect him to cope against any army, seen or unseen. He had his armored man holding in his hand a shield, and in his other hand a sword, which were the weapons of those days. That shield was the shield of faith, and the sword was the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I can't think of any more powerful weapons than faith and a knowledge of the scriptures, in the which are contained the word of God. One so armored and one so prepared with those weapons is prepared to go out against the army and is more to be feared than the enemies of the light. Armor, sword, weapon made of steel, only weapon listed. What the armor represents, the spirit, which is the word of God. Protected body part, entire body. What the protected body part may represent, our whole soul. Ephesians six eighteen, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Albert Robert C. Oakes of the Seventy observed that these weapons are used in the battle for souls. The weapons of eternal worth, reflecting the whole armor of God, as truth, righteousness, faith, prayer, and the word of God. These weapons are welded in our minds, mouths, and movements. Every righteous thought, word, and deed is a victory for the Lord. The stakes are extremely high. The prizes are the very souls of the sons and daughters of God their eternal salvation. And these souls will be won or lost on the basis of virtue and cleanliness, on the basis of charity and service, 
and on the basis of faith and hope. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Our mortal probation is a war, a continuation of the war in heaven, a war against the world, against evil, against Satan, and there is no neutrals. All men are for the Lord, or they are against him. They either serve under his banner, or they live under the manner of the world, and are in the bondage of sin. The only way for the Christian soldiers to come off victorious is to put on the whole armor of God. Paul did, and as his life drew to a close, he was able to affirm, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. King Mosiah did likewise, and after he had gone the way of all the earth, Alma the Younger was able to say to him that he had warred a good warfare, because he had walked uprightly before God. To the saints of latter days, the Lord himself revealed in these words the same truths previously given by the power of his Spirit to his ancient apostle. Lift up your hearts and rejoice, and gird up your loins, and take upon you my whole armor, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all, that ye may be able to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, which I have sent mine angels to commit unto you. Taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of my spirit, which I will pour out upon you, and my word which I reveal unto you, and be agreed as touching all things whatsoever ye ask of me, and be faithful until I come, and ye shall be caught up, that where I am ye shall be also. Points to ponder, as you consider the different pieces of of the armor of God, which piece do you feel is most critical for your life right now? What could you do to make sure that you are spiritually protected so you can withstand in the evil day? President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, I like to think of this spiritual armor not as a solid piece of metal molded to fit the body, but more like chainmail. Chainmail consists of dozens of tiny pieces of steel fastened together to allow the user greater flexibility without losing protection. I say that because it has been my experience that there is not one great and grand thing that, can, that we can do to arm ourselves spiritually. True spiritual power lies in numerous smaller acts woven together in a fabric of spiritual fortification that, that protects and shields from all evil. How are temple garments related to the armor of God? Elder Carlos E. A. C. of the Presidency of the Seventy explained, There is, however, another piece of armor worthy of our consideration. It is the special underclothing known as the temple garment, or garment of the holy priesthood, worn by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who have received their temple endowment. This garment, worn day and night, serves three important purposes. It is a reminder of the sacred covenants made with the Lord in His holy house, a protective covering of the, for the body, and a symbol of the modesty of dress and living that should characterize the lives of all the humble followers of Christ. See also 2 Nephi 1.23 Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness. Shake off the chains with which ye are bound, and come forth out of obscurity and arise from the dust. What does the whole armor of God protect you from? How does each piece of armor protect us spiritually? What can we do to help each other put on the whole armor of God every day? What can you do to more fully put on each piece of armor every day? See yeah.
Six nineteen, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the mystery of the gospel, said, The gospel and all things pertaining to it are beyond human comprehension unless and until men's souls are touched by the Spirit of God. True religion is a thing of the Spirit, not of the intellect. And it can only be known and understood by the power of the Spirit. To the carnal mind it is and ever shall be a mystery. Ephesians six twenty through 24 For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs, and how I do. Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister to, in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you, for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.